Joe, thanks a lot for your uh, depressing no, no, no. education. Encouraging. Encouraging. We can um, do this. Just, just one question. When you talk about now there's a facility for the DNR cooperating, working with um, local governments, right. how far down the political subdivision, like for instance, could we count on being able to get the DNR to cooperate, say, with the Bay Lake Township? Absolutely. I mean, they will go down to the city level. So the Township, so, I think, is lower than that. Well, that's okay. Uh, so, so we've, um, we've been involved uh, with local governments, including county, watershed district, city, and township, I think it'd be fine. They just don't want to deal with a homeowners association. There's just too many. And, and I think we'd get a little too radical. Chris? In close, close the gate, uh, you've ever had any boats stranded? If we ever get to a gate here, that's a big concern. Uh, the question is, if, if you uh, have a gate and you close a gate, do you leave boats stranded they can't get out? Um, the answer is no. Uh, the, the gate has an automatic ability to uh, open up if a car is trying to leave. Yes, I would agree with Dan. That was an excellent presentation. There was an article in yesterday's Minneapolis Tribune dealing with the ability to uh, chain off your access if you do not have monitors available. Yeah. Uh, would you care to comment on that? Uh, uh, yeah, so the, the Minneapolis uh, Park Board just uh, last week, I think it was, um, uh, took a very aggressive step on aquatic invasive species and for the, I don't know, three or four or five lakes that they have in the, in the cities, uh, they basically said, we are going to uh, chain these uh, accesses off because the threat is so imminent. It's, it, it, they invoke some emergency powers. We're going to chain these off for this summer except when we have inspectors there and those are going to be defined hours in the morning and to find hours in the afternoon or evening. And uh, uh, that's very aggressive. Uh, it's not clear that that's legal, uh, but I uh, immediately wrote the head of the park board who I've met and said, good job, way to, way to take leadership. Uh, because, you know, we, uh, they're looking at it and saying, if they do nothing, they are simply going to get the stuff happening. Um, some of the lakes in the, in the chain of lakes are fed from Minnetonka, so they're, they're going to be getting zebra mussels and other stuff anyway. But there are other lakes that, that feed the Minnehaha Creek, um, and they can protect those, and those are the ones I think that we're worried about mostly. So I'm totally for it. Uh, Joe, my name is John Weefall. We're on Birkeland Lake. Well, I want to thank you for assuming this kind of leadership. Yes. I dare say there's nobody in Minnesota. That's too much. Too much. You know, it always takes somebody somewhere to start it. And the time that you've spent is something that we're all grateful for. So you've launched a movement in Minnesota that's unstoppable. And I think you're right that Bay Lake has many similarities to Christmas Lake. We've got families here that are fourth and fifth generation. There's a sense of community and a desire here at Bay Lake to do exactly the same thing at Christmas Lake. I think what he's saying is they're the only lake right now in Minnesota that's got a barrier. The only one that's got a barrier. Well, at Bay Lake, we have to have a barrier here too. Uh, period, amen, good night. We have to have a barrier because otherwise, it only takes one boat with one zebra mussel coming in here, it's over. And, and as you say, that's just the beginning of these invasive species that are almost uh, interminable. Yeah. So, uh, are, are you meeting with the Bay Lake Improvement Board here coming up? Yeah, we're meeting right after the meeting. Yeah. Right. I mean, isn't that one thing to consider? We have to have a barrier. I mean, there is no question about it, because if there's no barrier, we don't always have somebody there from seven to six. So it's, it's kind of like uh, we need to set up something here that is going to guarantee us not 
but guarantee us that uh, we're going to do everything we can here to prevent this, uh, this zebra mussel and others from coming in. So I, I would say we're doing more than any other lake in the state except for, you know, your three lakes down there in the Twin Cities. But anyway, thank you so much for your brilliant work. I wish, I wish it was good. No. And I just wanted, I was going to whisper to him, but that's not fair, so I grabbed this. But I don't remember, uh, because I was probably worried about the PowerPoint, but did you mention the part about eventually your gate being activated by inspections? No, I didn't talk about that. So, um, so our, our long-term plan when we bought the gate was to have a remote inspection site. And then uh, if a boat passed inspection and wanted to come on Christmas Lake, they'd get a... Uh, four or five or six digit code like you get if you uh, bought a ticket at a car wash. Right? Uh, and then you can come over to the Christmas Lake Landing, punch in your code number, the gate goes up and you go in. Uh, so that's, that's what it's designed to do. Uh, after the DNR gave us so much grief about it, we just said, okay, then we're just gonna put a timer on it, at least for now, we'll just do it timer-based stuff. Uh, but we'd like to have the gate down all the time, except if a boat comes in with a valid code that said you just got inspected and you can come in. That, that's our goal. And at that point, it's an unattended access. You don't have to spend the money to have a person there to monitor the access. And it's the people at the access that cost all the money. The gate pays for itself in the first year. Yeah. And and the, the point being, you could you could possibly share with several lakes. Or Absolutely, the, share, the inspection. share the inspection station with several lakes, and now uh, now our cost for inspection, if you did it with three lakes, is a third. If you do it with four lakes, it's a quarter. If you do it with five lakes, it's a fifth. We don't know how big you can scale that. It probably has to do more with geography than it does with how many lakes or accesses are involved. What is being done uh, in the laboratories uh, to find some kind of a chemistry yeah. that will destroy just that particular invasive species? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a really good question. Um, if you just talk about zebra mussels, there is um, a chemical that is now approved by the EPA for point use. It's called Zequinox. Uh, it has not yet been at all tested for uh, wide dispersion in a lake. But, um, it, it is used by um, uh, water, uh, water companies that have huge water intakes. It's used by um, uh, companies that are sucking water out of the Great Lakes, um, like the paper mills, et cetera, to be able to have cooling water. Uh, and right now they're using chlorine and other really bad stuff to kill the zebra mussels to clean off their intake pipes. And so Zequinox has been approved for use, point use, in doing that cleaning. Uh, it's really expensive right now. Uh, the, the lead researcher that, uh, that identified the uh, Zequinox solution uh, is a guy, uh, uh, Dan Malloy, out of New York. He was our expert witness on our uh, lawsuit with the DNR, so I got to know him very well. Uh, but that's just zebra mussels, right? You'd need another one for quagga mussels. Uh, what's exciting is the legislature approved some uh, significant funding for uh, Dr. Peter Sorensen at the University of Minnesota, uh, who's, gonna, who's establishing an aquatic invasive species research lab. Uh, I, I talked with Peter, uh, several times. He's done a bunch of work at a nearby, at Lotus Lake nearby. Uh, and uh, he is very focused on this stuff. But, but that stuff is 10 years away at best. I mean, we're talking R&D. We're talking research that, that there is no known answer right now. So in the short term, what these guys will all say to you is avoid the problem as long as you can avoid the problem. And then, like cancer, avoid it as long as you can avoid it. And hopefully by the time, if you happen to get it, maybe there'll be a cure. So you've got to keep it up. 
Chris, I don't want to occupy well, any more time because I, I know you could. Maybe one more. One question. Oh, sure. How Sorry. serious is the threat from a jet ski? Their propulsion system seems to be a real nightmare when you're down at them when you're monitoring. You know, I, it's not clear to me. Uh, I, I don't know the. I don't know the. Uh, I don't know the mechanics of the, of, the, of the pumps that are in there and how much water they keep, but it would seem to me that it would be relatively easy to just flush them out with you know, spinning, the, spinning the jet. I, I know you don't want to spin the jet too much when there's no water going through it, but it would seem to me that would flush it out pretty fast. I, I, but I don't have a jet ski. I, I, don't, I don't know. Okay. 